Dave, welcome to Gnostic Media's podcast. How are you doing today? Uh, good, pretty good. Would you like to start off with telling us a little bit about who is Dr. Dave Nichols? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, who is Dave Nichols? Well, uh, I'm a distinguished professor at Purdue University in the School of Pharmacy. Been here since 1974. Uh, got a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, a PhD in Medicinal Chemistry, postdoc in Pharmacology, and have been working on the so-called psychedelics since I started my graduate work in 1969, so that's quite a long time. Uh, probably the only one that still work on LSD analogs, chemistry of LSD and its derivatives. Also have a parallel research program in uh, novel dopamine agonist, drugs that stimulate a type of dopamine receptor called the D1 receptor, which looks like it may be uh, a really good target for Parkinson's disease that nobody has really looked at seriously yet, and also a target for possibly improving working memory and cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. So I have actually two parallel research tracks, but both involve understanding how molecular structures interact with the receptors for dopamine and serotonin principally. And uh, because no one was particularly interested in the psychedelics, which were called psychotomimetics when I first started in the field, I basically had to engineer all my own pharmacology assays. So unlike most medicinal chemists, uh, we do everything in my lab from computer-aided drug design to uh, synthesizing molecules to uh, putting them into biochemical assays and receptors and mutating receptors and looking at the biochemical signals they produce and taking them on into rats and looking at their behavioral effects in rats. So I span the whole spectrum from conceptual design of a molecule to understanding how it may interact with the receptor all the way up to the behavioral aspects. So that's more or less, uh, in a nutshell, what I do and have been doing here since I got here in 1974. And how did you get involved with the study of psychedelic drugs? Well, in the, I graduated from high school in 1962. And of course, shortly thereafter and through the next decade, perhaps, uh, psychedelics became a very popular uh, from a recreational standpoint. A lot of friends uh, were using them and really with my science background, initially I was concerned uh, that my friends were smoking marijuana and we were going to become addicted to it and so I bought some pharmacology books and started reading and realized, boy, you know, that's it's not really true. Marijuana is not really dangerous. It doesn't produce addiction and all the things that were out there. So I started reading up, and then when the psychedelics, particularly LSD, started hitting, that was the real popular one, <clears throat> read a lot about that, and really became fascinated with how these molecules could work, because you would read about people having these profound experiences, uh, rebirth experiences, or you know, witnessing the Big Bang and the evolution of the cosmos, and you, you start thinking, wow, you know, where are these drugs working? Where in the brain? are they acting that they can produce these effects? And some people, uh, after they take one of these drugs, are, are changed. They're never the same, whether for, for good or bad. And that's actually, people now will ask me, why do you study LSD? And that's one of the sort of canned answers that I'll give. I'll, I'll say, think of the things that can change your life. Uh, you fall in love, you get married, you have a child, uh, a sibling dies, a parent dies, maybe a child dies, uh, or you take LSD and people sort of stop and realize what you've said. And I said, you know, here's a molecule that you take a very a very small, a tiny amount, uh, it, it diffuses into the brain, it stays a couple hours, and it diffuses back out. And for many people, they never see the world in quite the same way again, whether for better or for worse. And how is it that a chemical substance uh, can do that? And uh, I realized that the place in the brain, or the places in the brain now, we would say, where that occurs, must be fundamentally very important uh, in terms of the nature of our consciousness and determining who we are as uh, sentient human beings and so forth. So that was the underlying issue. And I'd always, even as a kid, been very interested in kind of unusual things and had often wondered, you know, why are we here on this earth and who are we really and what is humans and, you know, do we just live for a few years and then we die and then that's it? Or, you know, do you live after? Is there some part of you... That, so I'd always been kind of interested in philosophical questions. So this 
really crystallized, I guess, my thinking. But my talent seemed to be in chemistry. So how, how does a chemist do something, you know, to contribute to that field, that sort of field of philosophy or theology or whatever you might want to call it? And so I decided that understanding how these drugs worked and where in the, the brain they worked would probably be the best thing that I could do with my particular skill set uh, to get into that field. So today, what do you think about the death and rebirth type experience that people are having with LSD and other drugs? Is that something that uh, we've began to understand what is exactly happening, or is it something that we still don't really know for sure? No, we don't know for sure. Um, I think that this, uh, what I'll call, let's call it a mystical experience, a transcendental experience, and this is a thing that... Uh, that Roland Griffiths was looking at in his study at, John, at Johns Hopkins a few years back. I think that this experience is, uh, has the possibility for tremendous healing. Um, we've seen that, you know, I founded the Hefter Research Institute in 1993, and Charlie Grobe just completed a study of psilocybin in terminal cancer patients at UCLA Harbor, and it's been accepted for publication in Archives of General Psychiatry. And although the sample size was small, there were some very uh, some of the markers were statistically significant and others were very close to significance. And people who are approaching death and they're having sort of an existential crisis and, and a lot of anxiety and, and depression and, and emotional pain, for those people, having a, a powerful mystical experience can completely change their approach to death. This is something that was first discovered in the 1950s by an internist named Eric Cast in Chicago where he found that uh, he was just looking at the analgesic effects or pain-killing effects of LSD compared to the classical morphine-type drugs. And what he observed was that during the effect of the drug, LSD was as effective as, as some of these opiates. But for some of these patients who got LSD, they had significant pain relief for weeks afterward. And when he examined them, he found that their approach and perspectives on death had changed. And that actually led to some studies at the Spring Grove Hospital by Stan Groff and Al Kurland and that whole, Walter Pankey, that whole group who looked at the use of LSD in terminal patients and really found that uh, 60 to 70 percent of patients were helped by that treatment. And the ones who had the most, uh, the most uh, powerful effect were those that had a mystical or transcendental experience. So I think whatever that is, uh, it has tremendous potential for healing people, certainly people that are approaching death, but I think probably in lots of conditions that we don't understand yet. The research just hasn't been done, so we hope we'll find some of those. But how that happens, um, well, I've looked at it as much as anybody. In fact, I'm writing a book chapter now where I'm trying to explain what happens. And uh, the brain is so complex that it's going to be a while before we figure out things like that. But I think there are some, prom <laughs> some promising signs. Uh, you know, Franz Wollenweider in, in Zurich is uh, on the Hefter board, and we have a clinic over there that we support that he does studies in. And he's looked at human subjects on psilocybin using uh, PET scans and EEG and looking at what parts of the brain are activated. But the thing is, nobody has actually done any kind of a scanning experiment where we've caught somebody in the throes of one of these mystical experiences. And I think when we do that, we may start getting a little better idea of what kinds of uh, brain states uh, are, are happening during that experience. But I think it's very interesting. And if you can imagine, throughout history, some of the most powerful uh, effects on our societies have occurred as a result of people having these mystical experiences, people what we would call prophets or seers, and they come back and in, in some cases, I mean, most of the major religions have obviously been started by people who had some kind of a, a mystical or transcendental experience, and look at the effects on society over millennia from those experiences. So I think they're uh, very important. I think psychedelics are extremely important substances to study, and it's really surprising to me that there is only perhaps a handful of people that are seriously studying these. I mean, these seem to be some of the most fascinating psychoactive materials known to man. They uh, profoundly affect consciousness. If we want to understand what consciousness is, one of the ways to do it is to perturb consciousness with specific types of practices your yoga, meditation, or psychoactive drugs and understand you know, what uh, changes occur as a result and how that affects consciousness because uh, it's just, this is really the last frontier, I think, in, in brain science is understanding consciousness and uh, 
these are powerful tools. And it's just, again, I re just emphasize I'm, I'm so amazed that, that so few people understand how important it is to study these. And there's really no, no government funding at all. I mean, my funding came from the National Institute on Drug Abuse for 28 years. And they were really only interested in how these drugs work and why people like to take them. If you started talking <laughs> about therapeutic indications or how people might benefit, there's just no money out there. Go back to the use of LSD in treating pain. That, uh, that seems a very interesting subject because I have a friend who was in an automobile accident and, oh, 20 years ago, and he treated his pain for years with LSD. Yeah, there's, well, pain is a very subjective phenomenon. You know, people who are under a stress or anxiety, their pain is perceived as much more intense than someone who sort of is not. So you have the subjective component. Um, and then you actually have the physiological processes that involve activation of, you know, uh, pain uh, receptors and parts of the brain that respond to that, and then the perception of pain. But... Uh, for example, in the, in the dying patients who Eric Cass treated with LSD, or at the Spring Grove, the, the ones that uh, uh, Stan Groff and colleagues and uh, uh, that whole group treated, there was a change in the subjective, so that the pain, in many cases, although they were aware it was there, it wasn't painful. In other words, the sensation of pain was coming in, and they knew there was pain say, from the, tum the tumor areas or the, can the areas that were affected by cancer. But the awareness of how serious it was was just blunted in some way. So I don't know, and, and the studies he did with LSD, during the effect of the LSD, let's call it intoxication, there is an analgesic effect. And there are serotonin pathways in the brainstem that modulate pain. It may well be that LSD and psychedelics suppress pain at that level, at the physiological level. But I think in terms of long-term pain relief, uh, it, the psychological or perceptive part of it may be more impart, important in that you know the pain is there, but it's going to always be there and there's nothing you can do about it, so let's minimize it or let's put it out of our mind or let's think of some way to distract our you know, mind so we're not focused on it. I think the subjective component is probably more amenable to treatment with something like LSD than the physiological part of it. The Hefter Research Institute, and you are on the board of the directors with that, with Charlie Grobe and T Dennis McKenna, and uh, I believe a few other people are involved with that. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I when uh, I finished my PhD and postdoc work, I finished my PhD in '73, and then uh, postdoc about almost two years later. It really disturbed me that the uh, controlled substances laws and, and recreational use had really shut down research in that field completely. And uh, there were a lot of people at that time, it still, there was still a lot of media buzz about it, and people would talk about it, and I would sit and I'd go to meetings and say, yeah, these are really interesting, but nobody can work with them, you know, there's just no government funding, the government's shut it down, they just don't want to study these things at all. And I would tell people, but you know you could do it, you just couldn't do it with government money, you need some kind of an institute. And we're talking 1973, 1974. And I said, you know, back then, you know, you could get you know, maybe a million dollar endowment and and, ha and have a place where you could study these things legitimately. I said, I don't, there's no reason you couldn't do that. It's just you won't get government funding. And I told this people for years, told this people I'd go to scientific meetings and we'd sit down for a beer after dinner and I'd say, you know, you can study these, you just need private money. And it went from 